that these conditions can be allowed to prevail among a people uniquely entitled to call themselves the first Americans, a people whose civilization flourished here for centuries before the name America was thought of. This is nothing less than a national disgrace. to me um, very very many lessons and teachings that um, helped me find myself as a native woman and figure out where my place in this world was supposed to be and so um, by the second trip he had mentioned a saying to me that has stuck with me and it was that how can you fight the oppressor when you're speaking their language and so I brought that along with me to my journey on Northland and learning my language here um, second semester Ojibwe. Dave was a really big part of me becoming who I am today. So I owe a lot to him and his wonderful wife over there. Um, Dave had always asked me to come with him on the tour and I know that Michael and um, Anna had said I was welcome as well and I, I never did and I, reg I have regret about that. I wish I had experienced this with, with Dave Larson. Um, but I feel like he's here in spirit. I really miss Dave. There's been a lot of moments on this trip where I've thought about him and I've felt him. Like that first day when we had the pipe ceremony in the morning, I felt really sad. I was crying actually. And then this bird started singing and I felt like that was Dave just reminding me like why we were all there and that it was a good thing and that he was happy. We'd be driving down a road and Dave would say, okay, let's stop here. Uh, it would be like just some like side of the road, random place. And we'd get out and we'd go for a walk in some woods and, he, and he'd say, you know, here's this important space and this is what would happen in these places. And it wasn't part of the agenda, it wasn't part of the plan, but it was that additional experience that, that the students would get. Once we finally arrived at the right school, we took a tour of Wadukadating and saw how the immersion school is revitalizing the Ojibwe language. And we got to see the the kids only speak in Ojibwe and the teachers only speak in Ojibwe and they were actually checking in for the day. So they'd get called and they'd answer in Ojibwe. It was really cool. You know, of course there isn't all of the materials like you would find in English. So like little textbooks, things like this. Um, so they buy this. They would buy the same storybooks, but they would print out labels that were in Ojibwe and place it over the top of the English words. Um, or they would um, uh, so like today they were they were teaching ge geometry and so talking about shapes. Um, and so they make their own materials. They go you know find images, put them on the page, and print out the images and fold up the pages. Um, so it was really cool to see that and just, you know, knowing that the students are getting the opportunity to learn in their first language. Um, and that's just a huge opportunity for them to be able to, uh, to do that. And then to see the children, like, they're growing and, and sometimes it was interesting too, like she was saying that there's not really um, a word for the color orange. So like it's, orange is tied in with other language. And so they have to think about the pictures that they're printing out um, to, you know, so it lines up, it makes sense. Um, so here we are and the, they have, you know, some of the artwork that you see. Um, our students in, in the Twin Cities area, um, they don't necessarily get to see themselves reflected on the walls or reflected um, with the teacher standing in front of the room or walking through the hallways and you see the, uh, the men's room or the women's room or the, um, water faucet or whatever and the signage is all um, in English but around here they have the opportunity to see their own uh, language uh, which is it's very meaningful. 
Um, and I think the students got a good experience. We got so, so what is we their names? <laughs> so we and Gapo, they were saying that it's just that's what Pocana said. It's ah, it's, uh, not our, yeah. it's not our language. Okay. Yeah. So that's what that's what they're saying. They're like, you know, like and Pocana where John Smith says, "Oh hi," uh -huh. and she says, "We and Gapo." So that's what they're just. Kinda, okay, it was kind mm -hmm. of a joke. Yeah, making yeah. making uh -huh. you know just having a good time with you guys. <laughs> At UMD, we first went to their art museum that had a whole bunch of work from native artists and other lots of contemporary art. Uh, the one thing that I am really interested in learning about right now is the acquisition of indigenous languages as first languages for young children and cognitive benefits of that. So it's not just, you know, learning Ojibwe or Dakota or um, one of our many languages is a second language, but what does it mean for our, our children, for our babies to learn our languages as a first language? And what are the associated cognitive effective benefits of that? So that's one area that I study in my education field. I'm also very interested in the topic of war and how our peoples have long participated in wars in North America and the accomplishments that we have made to the larger benefit of our North American society. Um, free access most of the time. So we're being um, hosted by the American Indian Education Program here at, at uh, University of Minnesota Duluth. And um, we'll take a tour of the campus. They're gonna provide us with lunch. And so we're gonna spend some time here looking at the facilities and trying to get some of our students connected. So we're gonna put you guys to work, give you guys some red willow. Everybody doing good? So, do you see how? Yep, you're you're looking great. Yeah. Yep. I could, I'm kind of a pro at this. Are you? Yeah. We are harvesting tobacco. Yeah. Shashasha. You scrape all the bark off of the, this redwood plant. It's it's Talk traditional to tobacco, and it's used as Darren said. Talk to the creator. I had no idea why tobacco was important, and I learned a lot about that. Um, so that was really great. I was excited that what we were doing was actually useful. We weren't just like wasting something in order to learn how to harvest. This was going to go towards the powwow at Klokehai and other places. So I think that was really thoughtful of the folks who organized it at UMD. With our drum and our language, we say, uh, the way God, and they is your heart, your heart. So when I'm drumming, singing, what I'm trying to do is make a sound of a heart, a heartbeat, and that's what we do, a sound, a sound of a heartbeat. So like in the late 50s and into the 60s, we didn't have any drummers, singers. We might have had one or two dancers. And there was people that were concerned about us losing our culture and our traditions, especially with our language. And so um, in the community, um, really having a strong desire to have you know the culture and stuff integrated into the school, it started that process where you see you know these young people here that are very much involved in the culture it's just every day for them whereas 40 to 50 and beyond years it was very difficult to be able to um, practice or, or have anything to do with our culture language history had all the women as swans I love being a swan but it was actually really funny watching the guys become fish especially when it's high school boys it's like just so into their culture, it really makes me smile at knowing there's still young men out there wanting to be part.
Another time we witnessed the culture being kept alive was when we were invited to a hoop dancing performance. Courage, respect, humility, humbleness, kindness, and love. Those are our words that we speak to our children. And we make that design. We make that expression of love within ourselves. You see, Kanae Wag over there, Vanessa Wag, Thunderbirds. Watching such a, such a beautiful way of teaching in practice, that was beautiful to me. In Lac de Flambeau, we learned about the history of boarding schools. Being from here, I was shocked, I was, I was shook, because I didn't even know that like we had a boarding school here. Like, I didn't even know, it was crazy. So going there and like having that woman like talk to us about her experience and like what happened here, like, you know, nobody ever talked about that. And like she said, it's not talked about and I'm very grateful that she like preserved and like fixed it up so that we could learn about like our history and I think it's really good that we kept it here because we need to know what we've been through and what we can go through and that we, it just shows how strong of a people we are. And if we don't know that, then, you know, we're just, we're not gonna know our own strength as a community. We had kind of a little presentation on the boarding schools and the experiences that the people there had. And welcome, you are at what is now known as the Historic Boys Dormitory. This building was built in 1905, however, the school operated from 1895 to 1932. The 1934 Indian Reorganization Act. Remember that all of you way back there. 1934 Indian Reorganization Act. That is one of the keys of the one that act passed. This kind of what happened, like that. It was a really heartbreaking thing to hear about all of the abuses and the overcrowding and the assimilation that the um, community had to go through. Because I never knew there was a boarding school in Flambeau. Like, I never knew that. And it was really cool to see the old pictures, how, like, comparing the old pictures to what it looks like today. My idea of what the U.S. was is very different from the rather violent history that it has had in being formed the way it is. And I come from a culture that is uh, slowly getting eroded. And all of that has driven me to, I feel like if coming on this tour, I can find different ways of being in solidarity with Native people here. Learning about that just shows me that, you know, as a Native person, as a Native people, we can like get through anything we can go through assimilation we can go through, you know, people trying to take our culture away. And as we go through that, we still kept it somehow and we still got our language and we still got our teachings, which is like, you know, really cool. So as we were told the story about the doll and how they were told that if they could play their play ceremony or play social dancing or play um, practicing their ways with these dolls to help them to retain it. And then this old man came by and gave him a doll and said, play with this doll. This is how you can remember the language. This is how you can remember the ceremonies and the dances. And, and they'll be none the wiser, the, the staff, because it looks like they're playing with a toy. And I thought, wow, that, that's an amazing story. I don't know if it's that particular doll, but that's what that reminds me of. 1968, uh, President Kennedy called for a report on the boarding school system and he was noting like all the issues with the boarding schools and the runaways and the complaints from the communities. So in the Kennedy report, it, it was entitled A National Tragedy, The Boarding School System, A National Tragedy. We needed to take a ferry across Lake Superior to get to Madeline Island, a prophetic and sacred place for the Ojibwe people. I feel like it's going to be an awesome new experience. We got up bright and early to catch the ferry, but it was a cold wait. The boat ride over, there's the people that they had a few spots on the inside, um, and there's the upstairs, and so some people are pretty darn cold on our way over here. 
I think overall the knowledge that the students will receive will outweigh uh, being in the cold and having to deal with uh, uh, the weather conditions. It was interesting because a lot of the students had never been on a boat ride and so their first experience of being on a boat is uh, going on Lake Superior and, and, and cracking through some ice as we go along. Um, so some of them have been talking about um, it felt like we were on the Titanic or uh, different experiences like that. So it's been kind of fun uh, to hear some of their stories. I know, I mean, that's what I'm like. Think about like this is a trip that, you know, some of our ancestors have made previously without the use of these like big boats. I'm going to cry. This is cool. <laughs> but, but yeah, thinking about, you know, this is a pack that's not modern. Like this is something people have done for years. And, trying to imagine getting across Lake Superior without like <laughs> this giant boat. It's crazy. Yeah. So, it's cool. kind of cool. Yeah, it's, cool. <laughs> it's cool and it's cold. Yeah. So we were sitting up. Um, on, on, I was standing up on top uh, since and there, there was a section of the lake where it felt like the way just a thin layer of ice forms on top of water overnight felt like we were going through that um, and the only way we over there could describe it as was like fish scales so it was all these little little transparent pieces and it was making that sound of like that breaking ice but also the waves were there and it was rippling and it was either like looking at the back of a snake or a fish or a dragon or it looked really cool. It was like so cool like we were on the, bo on the boat and then the eye was like breaking and it makes some sound that is different. It was really fun but it was cold because I thought it would be like a fun experience on top of the boat but it was just really cold. I really enjoyed Malung Island. I really appreciate history. I think there's a lot to learn about culture based off of um, how a group of people develop over time. And so learning about Madeline Island and its importance is something that I didn't know about at all before, but um, it really helps me build a really great, greater appreciation for the people who really hold it dear to them being um, a descendant of people that live there and were born there at Madeline Island. Um, for me, number one, for myself, it was really powerful in connecting with homelands of my ancestors and, you know, walking in that same land. And then to be able to share that, to carry, um, carry that story and teaching forward to the younger people. And that's part of our process of the oral histories and passing it on and how we send it into the future to be able to share that experience with them. And they shared it with me, you know, me connecting with our homelands, but also many of them, you know, could have relatives or ancestors that also lived there and maybe were born there or buried there. And, you know, they just haven't traced that or made those connections at this early point in their life. One of the students, Aaron, noticed that there was a picture of his grandpa on the wall at our hotel so, in Lac de Flambeau. Right here is my great grandpa. Yeah, I have all my relatives down here at the museum. My grandpa's, my grandpa's in the museum. It's a picture of him over there. It's pretty cool. We're going ice fishing. Um, learning how to fish the traditional and modern way, harvesting some sort of fish that I forgot. At 60 degrees and we're on the ice, we might die and fall through, but. To be honest, I feel pretty skeptical about it just because it is pretty hot and you never know it might break. A little worried, but I think we should be fine, I hope.
think it's a good thing that are, you know, you're coming to learn our culture and it's something that's been forgotten and, you know, we're trying to keep this going on with our children here. You know, I have my grandson here with me and he's got some decoys to show you guys today. And, you know, that's just what we do in the winter time. We try to keep our kids off of all these electronic tools and get out and enjoy the wilderness and the lakes and everything that we have. Not more than two months ago, we were having a feast. We put our tobacco down on an ice and my son had speared a muskie. We ended up with six muskies and four northern that day. And all of it went to the feast we had around here for our community. And it was like the creator knew what we were using it for. So he gifted us with all of those fish and, you know, our kids got to see it. Greg Johnson took us into the forest to teach us about harvesting birch bark and later taught us how to weave that bark into baskets. birds I was talking about. There's birds in here, they look kind of like eyes, but what they're doing is they're like flying right towards you. And you can see that in there. Those are those birds that come from that legend. And you can see them right on here. And this wigwas, like I said, this offers life to us. Offers us protection, medicines. There's a lot underneath. And then he, what he offers us. So if I wanted to make a waterproof container, This might be a little thick, but you can also make a basket out of it. Um, and this is one of them trees you can pull off in layers too. It's always nice to get out of the city and into into um, you know nature and the natural state with with our relatives that are you know the rocks and the trees and the grass and the moss and um, and to be able to go into the into the forest with Greg is super impactful, especially I think for myself, but also for the young people who maybe that's not their everyday experience. Does anyone want the whole thing? Oh, here. Mats, you make a mat. Start weaving this like this. Like this, we can interlock this thing. We can start a beautiful big mat like that. Yeah. I just. Yeah. Okay. okay, I gotta go. Love you too. Wait, say hi. Greg taught us a lot of things, especially about the importance of tribal harvesting rights. From 1854 all the way up till 19, the 80s, there was a time in there where we couldn't hunt or gather. Even though it said, on a presidential signed um, paper that we could hunt and gather. It was against the law. So a lot of our people went to jail for that. The sturgeons are under protection in the ceded territory. So I said, well, they got a lake south of here. It's called Lake Winnebago. Have you guys ever heard of it? And they spear sturgeons on there. And they, they can spear up to 1,200 sturgeons on that lake. Non-natives can do this. So I says, I can't even get one sturgeon in the Cedar Territory. And they're like, oh, I don't know what to tell you, you know. And I'm like, man, you guys just follow too many laws, you know. So I, I go to this one site and I see these sturgeons and they told me that there's hardly any sturgeons here. Well, I, I, I trespassed into this area owned by a power company and I went to this river and I saw like 300 sturgeons. I knew the state was lying and I knew they had our tribe back into a corner with these lies. So I came back and I said, I'm gonna go get a sturgeon. And he said, you can't do it, Greg, you just can't do it. 
I said, okay. I said, we have this thing called a ceremonial harvest permit. I said, we can go get a deer anywhere we want with this harvest permit for ceremonies. I said, I'm gonna have a feast for my community, so I want that ceremonial harvest permit for a sturgeon. And they're like, uh, we never did a harvest permit for a sturgeon before. I said, well, write me one right now because those fish are um, spawning and I want to get one. And they're like, okay, you know, but I don't know what's going to happen. So they wrote me this permit. So, so I went out there and um, I get there and there's all these armed state wardens with rifles. And they're standing right in front of the area on a spear. So somehow um, when we de make a declaration on a lake or a saying we're gonna spear any kind of fish, we have to call the state and let them know what, that was, that was an agreement between the state and the tribe. So I get up there and I walk up to the river and I get my spear out and I had my friends with me and we had a little ceremony. We put some food in the water and we put some, um, our goods and our tobacco. We put all that in the water and then uh, I stand up there and there's these biologists standing there and they're quizzing me up. They're like, well, what are you gonna do? You know, I said, I'm gonna spear a sturgeon. And they're like, well, they're like, well, these are like our babies, you know. And then I asked the biologist, I said, why are you guys lying to the public about these fish? You know? And he's like, well, we don't want people in here to, to do this. And we're like secretly kind of restocking these lakes, they said, you know. Or the fish, fish biologist, he said, I have a, a, a tracker here. If you get a fish, we're going to put it, this tracker on his stomach and we're going to test to see if he's uh, one of ours. I get that spear and I walk out on this rocky ledge. And the guys are like, you're gonna have to walk out in those rapids, and those rapids are the kind of rapids that would take you, carry you away. And I said, I'm not, I'm not stupid, you know. They want, they want me to jump in the river and ruin my chance of getting these uh, fish. So they're like really trying to deter me from getting a fish. Anyway, I stood there, and the guy says, those fish are gonna see you. They're not gonna swim up to you. And then we had one 55-inch sturgeon swim right in front of me and stop. <laughs> and I speared him. And he's, I could just hear those scientists, they're like, oh my God, you know. <laughs> and so I pull it up and it's this huge sturgeon and it's flopping around and my friends come over and they help me get it, you know. And I said, this isn't a scientific fish, you know, there's no markings, there's no tags on it. He goes, well, according to that guy, that's impossible. He goes, where do you think that fish came from? I said, I said the great spirit put this fish here. These, these scientists didn't do it, you know. I said, hey, scientist, come here. So he came over. I said, where's your little beacon thingy, you know? He said, right here. I said, I'm gonna hold the fish. You're not gonna touch it, but you're gonna see if that tag is in there. And he wove that thing over the top of it. And he was blown away because that fish was a natural reproducing fish. <laughs> and he couldn't get over it. He was like, I can't believe it, you know? And I said, see, you guys don't know everything. And I took that fish and I got out of there. <laughs> Storytelling is such, an, such a beautiful mm -hmm. part of the learning on this trip, both from elders and from each other. Mm. And how much of our time is spent listening to stories. <laughs> yeah. Without always a, this is the moral ending to that story, you know. Paco and Mary Ellen shared some stories with us and some music too. How much you mean to me I'm forever in my heart and in my soul So I'll be strong and I hold on Cause I'm letting go Years have flown by and changes that come like a rain. I appreciate like all the elders telling us like what they know and what they have experienced and their and like what happened in the past and stuff. It's been a good run. I'm glad you're one of my students, but you know, it feels like um, I'm your student too, because you've been teaching me so much as well. 
and a lot about humility. And so I really thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the one thing I really liked yesterday was when just talking with Jerry, it just reminded me of like talking to other elders. And now the time has come for me to fly. I'm going home beyond the sky to a place. I kind of treated up tonight because it just reminded me of Yeah. Yeah, I know. One more hug. Oh, you're the best. Gosh, I'm glad I got to know you. And, and it was you, right? It was you that had me get to know you. Like, you, you, you did that. And I, I thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I know it hurts your soul to say goodbye. Dry those tears in your eyes. I hope you see. How much you mean to me I'm forever in your heart and in your soul So please be strong and hold on Thank you taking water out of Lake Michigan, California, and Canada. And they're, they're taking the water for nothing, and they're selling it back to us. And we buy it. And the cheaply made bottles that they have, I kept one in my car one time, and I let it sit in there. After two days, I opened up that bottle, and it smelled like oil. So we're trying to boycott Nestle products because of that. And the, chair, uh, the, the president of Nestle says that we don't deserve water. Water isn't supposed to be free, which it is. The Great Spirit put water on, on earth for us to live. One way to honor the Great Spirit is through a sacred water ceremony, which Lisa guided us through while on Madeline Island. A traditional way of interacting with that water and recognizing that water as its own entity. And it also gives them the teaching in the, in the talk that we give about the water and where um, explaining about the ceremony. So water, amongst our Anishinaabe people, the responsibilities we talked a little bit about life giving and that and part of that life giving is the water and how we talked about a relationship with grandmother earth grandmother or grandmother moon mother earth and women as life givers and water is that first medicine water is that life you know our teachings come through the drum and uh, we use a water drum and when they sound that drum that water that the that, uh, teaching echoes through that water and vibrates out and resonates through every cell in the body and can change the DNA. It can reset the vibration in your body because there's uh, there's certain frequencies that that our body is healthy at, and so so there's a there's a whole lot more to water than just drinking it. Yeah, go away.
At the Wolju B Tribal Gardens, owned and operated by the Midwakanton Sioux community, we were taught about the tribe's efforts to provide organic foods to its people. Right now we are in Shakopee at an agricultural farm with lots of chickens. And we had lunch from homegrown food here. And we're visiting plants that are being grown. And also I scooped up some items from my own classroom with um, pine cones and walnuts. That one's gonna be cool. It's not opened yet versus this one that is opened. So I get to pass on some knowledge to my friends. So this is really cool. Picked up a chicken. A rooster. How did it feel? Soft. Soft? Yeah. Soft. Did it squirm at all? No. It was very nice. It was very nice. No. No. The bus did serve as a moving classroom, but we made time to have some fun on the last day, singing karaoke together. Come and get your love. Come and get your love. Bus ride today was awesome. There's Jocelyn just stepped up and took control and we all sang and laughed and smiled. The whole point about the bus is it becomes a classroom and so um, you get to see students really coming out of their shells. You know, a classroom on wheels is what I've called my trips in the past. You know, the world is our classroom and I'm a firm believer in taking advantage and opportunity of every teachable moment there is, you know, and using that time for the students to peer teach. I think each time that one of them presents, like on the bus, I've noticed that they stand a little taller as they walk back to their seats. And to me, that's really beautiful. There's so many students at the University of Minnesota who I think don't get a chance to have rich experiential education and culturally relevant getting off of the campus and into the watershed surrounding the great Twin Cities. You know, we decided that it was an incredible experience to um, get our students in our program to learn about their cultural heritage. And uh, I'm really thrilled about this. I'm thrilled that it's, that's now a college course I mean, that just adds to the appeal. When his uh, Indian education advisor, Randy, contacted me and said it was the Dave Larson, uh, it was named after Dave Larson, I was very happy because um, Dave Larson was one of my teachers and uh, he taught me a lot and um, just very grateful that he, uh, he's being acknowledged and recognized like that. The Environmental Initiative uh, recognized the tour as um, uh, kind of innovative in the kind of engagement and education that it's doing about a topic related to the environment. And so I think that's a big step that a kind of mainstream environmental group is recognizing that an experience that's really putting sovereignty and the presence of American Indian people and cultures first is also a program that's teaching and leading on environmental issues. Most students would never get to experience anything like this, even if they took a class for a whole year. So just the transformation you see in people in such a short space of time is just really amazing. I'm so glad that these students can get their credits in this just totally different environment. <laughs>